So, in this course, guys, here's how things will generally work when you get when we're having a, like a lecture day. Okay, um, you'll see a screen like this. All my lessons that are lectures will start this way. They'll have the, the lesson number and the title, and then they'll have the key points. Okay, and the key points are those things that you could expect to see assessed on a quiz or a unit exam, or that might be important for getting a lab or an assignment completed. Okay, they're the important things. They're the things that if you're reviewing your notes, you're going to want to highlight in the notes so that they stand out. You know that you have to know these particular things. All right, so key points for this one. We need to understand how the theories of the structure of the atom were developed. Why did people think the atom looked this way and then later think it looked a different way? All right? Why why did this idea change? Okay, what came along to change our thinking? All right? And then uh, secondly, learn the parts of the atom and their characteristics. That's probably a review. What are the three parts of the atom? Neutron, electrons that are in the cloud. Yeah, and Protons, okay? So your three parts. We're not going to go into the things that make up protons and neutrons. You do that in physics 30 when you talk about up quarks, down quarks, strange quarks. There's all kinds of different quarks, okay? So we're not going to talk about those in science 10. They're not important for what we're doing. All right. Anybody need that one anymore? Okay, I'll give you another minute there. So what is an atom? Anybody know? Yeah, it makes up all matter, not even just people, but any any material, any matter on earth is made up of atoms. Okay? Are all atoms the same? No. Okay, they're not all the same. Every different material has different types of atoms or molecules as the case may be on some things. Okay? That's what we're going to kind of be looking at and going over today. Okay, um, I don't know that you need to write this slide down. Okay, it's probably not as important as some of the other stuff we'll go over. This is just the history kind of behind this. All right, um, so alchemy and the birth of chemistry. So the earliest things that could be considered like chemistry would have been alchemy. It was something that went kind of on in the you know Middle Ages kind of thing. It was a trial and error type of of stuff that was going on. That was you know mixing things together, seeing what would happen. While it wasn't real science, it was still valuable in that we learned a lot of things about the behavior of matter. Okay? Unfortunately, a lot of it didn't get recorded properly, and you know, because it wasn't using the scientific method, it wasn't all as valid. But we still learned lots of things, like how to you know, dye cloth, tan leather, prepare food, preserve food. Okay? People knew for you know, years and years that if you heavily salted meat, it took a lot longer for it to, to spoil, okay? and things like that. So those are all things that we kind of discovered that way. Okay, first idea of the atom obviously came from the Greeks. I mean, the Greeks thought th thought of lots of things because they had guys whose job was to think of stuff. What were they called? Actually, they were called thinkers. And being a thinker was the sweet gig, okay? Because you just you sat around and people you know waved palm branches and fed you grapes and you just thought stuff up, okay? And some of the best thinkers were people like Aristotle, Plato, okay? Uh, people like that who you know just came up with ideas that seemed to explain things that happened, all right? Aristotle, right? And he he thought that all matter was made up of four elements, right? Everything was made up of earth, air, fire, and water. Okay, or some combination therein. So, you know, if you had a, a pot full of water, it was all just water. But if you heated it up and steam started coming off of it, steam was different than water. So they thought. Obviously, we know it's different, but, okay. Steam was some parts water and some parts fire and some parts air, right? Because it was different now. We changed it. Steam wasn't the same as water. So they thought because, I mean, they didn't have, you know, lots of scientific abilities to study stuff. But it made sense, okay? Thinkers' jobs were to come up with explanations for why things happen, okay? And having four elements, that was logical, okay? If you looked at, you know, bubbling lava, bubbling lava was some parts earth and some parts fire, okay? It all made sense. And they had a periodic table of sorts that told you which things and how much of them were, were each of these elements. Okay? It made sense. It was something they could, they could experience and that could be easily explained to them. Right? Obviously it was wrong, okay? but 
that's what people went along with. Now, a guy named Democritus, he had this different idea about matter. He said, no, I think matter is made up of these tiny invisible particles. Everything is made up of these. Now, when you've got an explanation that makes sense, and it was come up with by a guy named Aristotle, who's widely respected, and your idea is invisible particles, how well accepted are you going to be? Yeah, you basically got laughed out of the building, right? Like, no one's, whatever, Democritus, get out of here. You and your invisible particles can take a hike. Okay? Unfortunately, he was right. Okay? People just didn't know enough that to know that he was right. Now, it wasn't all bad for Democritus. He went on and thought up some other cool things, like, sounds like his name, democracy. So it wasn't all bad for him. He did come up with some good ideas. Okay? Um, you know, so they, they, they were kind of, there wasn't necessarily you thought about science or you thought about uh, politics or you thought about whatever they, they thought about all kinds of things and you got lots of time when all you do is sit on your butt and get palms waved at you and eat grapes so okay, they had lots of time to think stuff up okay uh, this picture down here okay we can see that we've got uh, some of the different models of the atom that have been thought up okay over the the course of uh, you know the last you know 2,000 years or so Okay, uh, and we'll go into detail on each of those, but you can see that there's kind of a natural progression in the shape okay, of the atom. Now there is one kind of big jump, okay, between the planetary or Rutherford model and okay and what we have here, but okay, we'll explain why those kind of jumps were made. All right, so back to the alchemists. What were the alchemists trying to do? Well, they were trying to get rich. Okay. They figured there had to be a way to transmute one substance into something else. Namely, turn cheap stuff like lead into expensive stuff like gold. All right. Now, we know that that's chemically, physically impossible because the atoms of gold are different than the atoms of lead. You can't turn lead atoms into gold atoms. It just doesn't happen. Okay. But they were trying all kinds of things in order to make it happen because they didn't know any different. Right? Now, like I said, the alchemists came up and discovered lots of things. You maybe didn't have a great life expectancy as an alchemist. I'm sure many alchemists discovered gunpowder, but it took you know one guy to live long enough to tell everybody else about it. Okay? But they would mix things together. And, oh, oh, well, nothing happened. <laughs> Chuck that, try something else. It wasn't a scientific endeavor. It was trial and error. Oh, that, well, then nothing happened. Oh, I didn't get gold out of that one either. Chuck it. Okay, there wasn't any recording of data and, and you know, sort of communication. That was the big thing. Alchemists were always in competition with each other. They didn't want to share their discoveries with each other. So everything kind of just stalled, right? No one, no one was able to combine their, their resources or anything like that. This is what a alchemist lab would have looked like. Very much you know, kind of like a Frankensteinian type of lab, okay? Mortars and pestles and beakers and flasks and all kinds of you know crazy looking things okay, that they would have used to, to do their, their work. Okay. Okay. Luckily, a little bit later on, these two guys came along. Okay. Uh, Bacon and Lavoisier were the guys that essentially took sciences, sciences, we'll use that term loosely, like alchemy, and turn them into respectable things that were useful and proper. Okay? Um, what they did was essentially come up with the scientific method, which is what you use every time you do a lab. Okay? You decide on a problem that you're going to investigate. Okay? And it's more complex than what happens when I mix substance A and substance B together? Okay, that that was an alchemy problem. A scientific method problem would be, uh, you know, what are going to be the properties of the material produced when these two things are mixed together? Right? Then you'd come up with your hypothesis, and you'd have your materials and your procedure. You'd have your data. You'd analyze your data, and you'd come up with a conclusion, and you would communicate that with other people. That's the scientific method. That's what these guys were responsible for. Okay, they took alchemy and turned it into chemistry. Okay. All right. Now, the idea of the atom has its resurrection here, okay, 2,000 years approximately after Democritus thinks it up and gets laughed out of the uh, Parthenon in Greece. Okay. The um, reason it came up is because people were starting to realize that Different things had different properties. Different materials had different properties. Okay, um, have you ever heard of the story of Archimedes? Okay, he was the uh, the king's scientist, and uh, the king had this jeweler or blacksmith build him a crown, and he gave him like 
well, let's say just pick a number, a hundred grams worth of gold to make his crown out of, right? And when the king got the crown, he's like, hmm, something, you know, something seems fishy here. Yeah, it looks like gold, but I think, you know, yeah, it still weighs the same or has the same mass as the stuff I gave him, but it just doesn't feel right, okay? And Archimedes discovered that if you place something in water, depending on how dense it was, it would displace a certain amount of water, right? He discovered it supposedly, the story goes by, getting in the bathtub and seeing water go over the edge and then running through town naked telling everyone that he'd figured something great out. Scientists are quirky, I guess. <laughs> okay, so anyway, he discovered that, so he took 100 grams of gold and he put it in, in a container and he watched how much water got displaced. Then he took the king's crown and put it in there and found that it didn't displace as much water. Okay, so it told him, hey, the jeweler or the blacksmith or whatever stole some of the king's gold in the process of making this crown. Okay, he put some other stuff in there, he heated it up and he alloyed it together. Essentially, the jeweler had made the, cr uh, the crown out of brass, which looks like gold, okay, but obviously isn't. Okay, it's an alloy of copper and tin. The guy had pocketed all the gold, which of course got him beheaded, because in that time kings didn't like getting screwed over. Okay, so, right, that's the, people were starting to discover that things, some things had different properties than others. Okay, that led Dalton to think that, well then, Maybe things are made up of these tiny little particles, and each material's particles are different. Okay, so Dalton came up with what we call the atomic theory. Okay, all right. So the idea here is, guys, that if we kept cutting something, let's say I had a chunk of iron, and I just kept cutting it into smaller and smaller pieces. Okay, do all the small pieces that are on my table have the same properties? Yeah, because they're all iron, right? They may all be different sizes, but they all have the same properties, same density. They would all be attracted to a magnet, all that kind of stuff. Oh, yep. Um, not usually. Just go ahead. That's okay. Just make sure you sign out, like Mr. Lyle said this morning. Okay. Um, so, yeah, if I have these chunks of iron and they're all there, they all have the same properties, okay? They would all, you know, if I left them out, they would all rust. They would all react with oxygen in the same way. And that's because the particles they're made of are all the same. If I take, let's say, a chunk of lead and I start cutting it up, all those chunks of lead have the same properties, but not the same properties as all the chunks of iron, okay? They're different materials, so their particles are different. Everybody follow where I'm going with that? Okay, so that kind of led to this development of the, uh, the resurrection of the idea of the atom. Now, could you actually physically keep cutting something down until you got to a single atom? No. Okay, we, we've never been able to see an atom. We have a pretty good idea of what they would look like, but no one can see one. They're way too small. All right, you could never, you know, if you were cutting carrots at home on the cutting board, you, know, you, you wouldn't have to worry about causing a nuclear explosion. You can't split the atom with a knife. Right? Why? The knife is thousands of atoms thick, even on the sharp end. Right? So you never have to worry about doing that. Right? You're never going to split the atom at home. Okay? It's just not going to happen. So, yes, you could cut. You could keep cutting things down, and theoretically, if you kept cutting it smaller and smaller, if you had a tool that could do that, you could cut down to a single atom. Okay? But all that atom and all the other pieces around would all have the same properties. Okay? Reason for that: every single atom in those chunks would look the same. Okay, it would have the same number of protons, same number of neutrons, okay, and same number of electrons. So the protons are the positives, the orange ones here are the neutrons, okay. They would all have the same properties, okay. Every chunk of that piece of iron would have the same types of atoms. You wouldn't be able to tell them apart, okay. All right. I would write down the four points of Dalton's atomic theory. That they are important, so we should go over those. Okay, so through all of his experiments, Dalton came up with these four ideas. First being, all atoms, or all elements, sorry, are composed of tiny, indivisible particles called atoms. Okay, not invisible, indivisible, right? The word atom actually means uncuttable, right? It means you can't make it any smaller, you can't break it down into smaller parts. We know that's not true, but at the time it made sense.
Okay, so the idea is here that Dalton came up with. Dalton did a lot of experiments about the behavior of matter when it's by itself and when it's mixed with other types of matter, so chemical reactions, things like that. Okay, first point, everything's made of these tiny indivisible particles called atoms. Now, for the most part, we, we know that that statement is still true. Okay, is there some part of it that we could manipulate to possibly make it look like it's not true? Which part of that statement would you say may now in modern times be considered to be untrue? Uh, of the, just of point number one. John? Yeah, we can split the atom now. That's fission, right? That's how you make nuclear power. It's how you make nuclear bombs. Okay, They all use essentially the power that's in the nucleus of the atom. right? We can split the atom. Does it retain the properties it had before? No. Okay, when you split an atom, you make other materials, right? But it doesn't happen, you know, in nature. Like we said, you can't do it at home on the cutting board, right? And you don't see, you know, just nukes popping off randomly in nature. It just doesn't happen, okay? Um, with our modern technology, yes, we can split some atoms, but they have to be really, really big, okay? When you use nuclear power, you're using things like uranium, plutonium, okay? Big big atoms, right? Give you an idea. An atom of uranium has 92 protons. That means it has also in addition to that about 145 um, neutrons, okay? And then 92 electrons. That's a big atom. Yeah, you still can't see it. Atoms are small, but for an atom, that's big, all right? The bigger an atom gets, the harder it is for that atom to stay together. Okay, it would be like it's easy to hold on to somebody if they're really close to you. You can just put your arms around them and hold on to them, and they can't get away. All right, but if they're six feet away from you, how easy is it to hold on to them now? Is it nearly impossible? Right. The further away the parts of the atom get from each other, the harder it is for that atom to stay together. Okay. So if we can shoot small particles at big atoms, we can make them break because they're weak. All right. When they break. They release energy. Now, if I was to split one uranium atom on the desk here, if I could actually do that, you'd never even know what happened. Okay, one atom doesn't contain a lot of energy, but it's the chain reaction that happens when you do it. If you have a chunk of uranium and you split one atom of it, the pieces of that atom go off and break the other atoms that are nearby, and they release chunks, and you get this chain reaction that releases lots and lots of energy. Okay, in a nuclear pl power plant, that works something like this. In a nuclear power plant, you have what's called a fuel rod. And on that fuel rod are pellets, called fuel pellets. They essentially contain concentrated uranium. Okay. Then you, uh, you put them in water and you shoot small particles at them. And when the, when the particles hit them, they start to undergo the fission process. They start to split. When they do that, they release large amounts of heat. That turns the water into steam, turns a turbine, generates electricity. Right? That's how you generate electricity with nuclear power. Right? You split the atom and you harness the heat from it. Now, you don't want that to get out of control. That's why you have a fuel rod. You don't expose the whole rod at one time. Right? That would be bad. But if you expose only a small part of the rod to these particles, you get a controllable rate of fission, and then, then it doesn't blow up. Okay? It doesn't go Chernobyl or what's the one in Japan that's poisoning all the fish. Okay? Yeah, you don't have to worry about those kind of problems then. All right? In a nuclear bomb, you do want it to get out of control. So you do it a little differently. Tomorrow, I will tell you how to make a nuclear bomb. Okay. So don't forget, guys, if you get a chance, print those notes tonight. Okay, bring them with you tomorrow. Save you a lot of writing tomorrow.